Okay, uh, hi everyone, it's SmithyQ, SmithyQ.com, and uh, here we're going to have a, a game analysis. I guess this is a kind of a good news, bad news uh, situation. The good news is, yay, there's a game analysis. I did my first uh, long play game, so uh, I was, you know, 50, the, whatever the classical time control is on my chess. So I played that, woohoo, here it is, the analysis. Uh, the, the downside is that it was uh, decided by a fairly trivial blunder, but there's some interesting things in here as well. So. It's going to be re relatively quick in terms of the actual like chess thing. Don't blunder your uh, your queen, right? But I I want to kind of talk about blunders a little bit because sometimes that's basically what we do. We just dismiss that. It's like oh I hung my queen, but there's often something that precedes the blunder or it's part of our thought process. So there's something along that lines in which we can actually. If we're aware of these things, we might be able to fix it in terms of our games, we'll blunder less. Alternatively, like what happened here, you might be able to increase the um, opportunity for your opponent to blunder. So we'll, we'll take a look at what I mean in a second. So again, I was black in this game, and I get to try out the, uh, the King's Indian. Uh, if you've been watching the channel for any length of time, you'll know that this is an opening I've been trying to learn with mixed success. I've been really trying it over the... Uh, a holiday break here to um, <laughs> to really learn it uh, and well the first game of 2020 kind of worked really well so we're actually in a system that I'm not very comfortable with that I honestly don't know the theory at all <laughs> if I'm uh, being honest and this is with the uh, known as this the Samish variation with the f3 and there's a couple ideas that are involved but in general this at least in my experience through the online blitz and uh, just online chess, is that it's used predominantly by people that want to attack. Um, that is, if I were to back up, uh, let's just go all the way back. So there's openings like, uh, you know, the perk, or, uh, you know, the dragon, Sicilian, whatever. We'll just get to a position like this. Right? In which we have this type of pawn structure, in which the F pawn is securing the E4 square. We got the queen and bishop battery, so we're going to come here. The pawns are going to fly down the board. Sack, sack, mate. Right? This is the idea. And so, often, when I see this system with F3, that's exactly what white is doing. And so white is playing G4, H4, queen D2. He just wants to checkmate. He'll either castle queen side or he'll just leave his king in the center. He's going to try and block the center, and then he's going to mate. So um, this is the first clue that this might be an opponent, um, white um, opponent here, really wants to attack. And I have found... Um, so very often, when people, they really love attacking, they, that's basically the only thing they know how to do in chess. And if you can turn the game into anything else, so either it becomes a positional struggle, or you attack them first, you stop their attack because you land the first blow, then um, the game can turn on a dime. And it's more of a psychological thing than it is a chess thing. In terms of pure, you know, chess position, they might be perfectly fine. But your mind, it can be hard to wrap around the new situation, especially if you really like attacking, you can't attack, and then all of a sudden, you, your brain doesn't really work anymore, basically, and then you make a simple blunder. And I, that sounds kind of far-fetched, but that's pretty much exactly what's happening, what will happen in this game. My opponent, he is someone who wants to attack, and I'm going to create a position where that doesn't happen, where I attack first. I get the first sacrifice in. And then he essentially falls apart in three moves. I'll show you what I mean. So first I played knight c6. Just for the record, c5 is the main line. And then after, you know, there's this famous uh, gambit line here, where I believe the next move is knight c3, in which black is down a pawn, but he's got really nice activity, and white has some really weak dark squares. Uh, at the same time, a pawn's a pawn. Um, this is the probably the best line for both sides. Apparently, it's quite drawish. Apparently, well, not apparently, there is a heck of a lot of theory. I don't know it. And so I'm playing uh, this idea, knight c6, just developing. Um, I've tried some other ideas. Um, there's like this weird a6, b5, c6 line. Um, I've tried e5, but e5, that seems to really help white when he wants to do this juggernaut attack over here. And so let's take a look and see what, what knight c6 happens. Opponent plays queen d2. There it is. He's got that battery already. 
I play a6. <laughs> um, why not? Then he plays bishop d3, um, which is not very common. And one of the main problems with the bishop is if we just back up, we can see here the queen and the bishop both control d4. And once the bishop is in front, well, it blocks the queen's um, control of d4, which means a strategy involving this square can work very well for black. So that's exactly what I did. I played e5, and then I'm able to jump my knight in there. I would absolutely love it if white were to take, giving up his dark squared bishop. That would be a huge blunder in this position. Um, my bishop would have no counterpart, and it would, like, look at all, all of his pawns are on light squares. And so all these dark squares, right, they're just asking um, to be invaded. So you can imagine things like this, or, you know, things like this. Um, the queen's going to be coming in, or I can play c6, the queen comes around this way. And so the, 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 they're just too weak. And of course, he doesn't do that. He ended up playing um, knight e2 instead. And then I played um, c5, which wasn't the most accurate way of doing things. I checked later. Um, either playing knight h5 or knight d7. I'll just put knight d7 on the board, because now the bishop is helping control the knight. And so, again, he can't take with the knight. That's a fork. Whoops, that's not very good. Can I back up? Aha. Uh -huh. And again, he never wants to take with the bishop. So this would have been a, um, a more accurate way of doing things. Just because if he ever takes on passant, I need to recapture with the knight, and so my knight has spent several tempi backing up. We both have um, weaknesses, right? He's got a weak pawn here. Uh, uh, sorry, a weak square. I have a weak square. Uh, Frig arrows don't seem to want to work today. Uh, not, but did they ever want to work? Anyway, um, he's got a very weak square. I got a very weak square. It seems like I also have a very weak pawn. Uh, computer likes white's position a lot more, but you know what? The computer always likes uh, white's position in the King's Indian, so that isn't always the defining thing. Anyway, this was certainly the best way for um, white to play. Instead, uh, he ended up playing bishop to h6. Um, so, again, um, this is the clear indication that the only thing he wants to do in this position is attack. Because this is the clear thing. This isn't even a good bishop right now. Like, in this pawn structure, I have all my pawns are on dark squares. And so, doing this swap isn't really benefiting him. It's just um, swapping the bishop. Um, but clearly what he wants, again, he's gonna, um, the classic idea is to exchange the bishop, then throw the pawns down the board. Um, g4, h4, he gets the queen in here, and again, sack, sack, mate, as Fisher said. And so, at this moment is when I realized, like 100%, before, just based on his opening, I suspected that this was type of an aggressive player. Same thing, putting this bishop on d3, that seemed like something you don't normally do in the same -ish variation. It's something you would do in the perk or the modern, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so this here, it's now, he wants to attack. And so whatever I do, I want to make sure I attack first. This is why I played bishop d7, and this is also where I can jump in. Uh, well, I'll just say what my idea was, is again, I'm playing bishop d7, I finished development, I'm preparing to play b5, because everything controls b5. And this is going to either, well, it will open lines on the queen side, and that will either discourage him from castling queen side, um, or it, it'll just give me play. And that's what I want, right? The more open lines, the more better. Now, all that's great, all that's true, um, but psychology, psychology can go too far. Um, th this is still a chess position, and there are tactics, and I'll be honest, I did not even ask myself, is there a tactic in this position? I was so focused on the psychology of the moment. So, um, whoops, I'm also a little bit rusty, I haven't played very much, but let's not use excuses. Um, there's a really common tactic, which I should have seen, is simply, let's put it on the board, knight takes, doesn't matter how he recaptures, because now all of a sudden we have queen, it's check, the uh, the bishop is hanging, so you just imagine g3, boom, and now uh, white's in a huge trouble. He's down a pawn, he's lost his dark squared bishop, and he's well, he's just losing at this point. Uh, he's, he's busted. So, that, uh, so this game could have ended even sooner. <laughs> Instead, I played uh, bishop d7, take, take. And I'm perfectly fine here in this position. Um, one nice thing about having the king on g7 is, of course, it stops him from getting his queen in. It also, it might let my rook slide over. So if there ever were a lot of pressure on the h-file, it's easier for the rook to defend on, um, 
It's easy for the rook to slide over, basically. But I wasn't worried at this point. I didn't feel as if he had much of an attack, and it would take him several more tempi. As it is, he took, I took back, he moved back, I continued my plan, b5, ready to open the position up even more. Uh, on the queen side, right? And he probably doesn't want to castle there anymore, because the c file is going to open up, right? If you were to castle, does that make any sense at all with this, you know, with this, with this, the pawns? No, of course not. Which is why he didn't castle. He instead, being the aggressive attacking player that I suspected he were, he played g4. And so, again, here come the pawns. He's going to leave his king in the center. If the center blocked, things are potentially okay. And again, sack, sack, mate. What can we do to stop that? Um, this is an idea that I've seen in um, a couple of the King's Indian sources that I've been working through and trying to uh, learn. Again, I've been spending the last two weeks, week and a half, whenever the exams ended, uh, really um, digging into some King's Indian literature. And so then I used a really thematic idea. I'm quite proud of this, actually. The computer says it's great. I first took on c4, and this, uh, this moves the bishop away. Right, because right now the bishop's defending e4, so by taking, the bishop's over here now, and this lets me use a potential sacrifice. Bishop takes pawn. Pawn takes, and then knight takes e4. So again, with the bishop on c4 now, there's no defend the pawn. The knight comes in, and just look what's happened here. Let's, uh, we'll just, white has to move the queen. And so again, this knight dominates the board. I've got very strong center pawns. The center is now wide open. You know, a couple moves ago, where it was all closed, um, White's king, it seemed okay in the center. But after we exploded open, with all these pawns are moving, now it's no longer anywhere near safe. Again, the queen's attacks, the queen has to move, and now we've got these lovely checks coming in. It's going to force White, um, and his king's safety is now the most important thing. I've already got two pawns for the piece, so I'm barely down material. If I can win one more pawn, then I'm not even down material. This pawn is weak, and that pawn is potentially weak, and maybe these pawns are weak. Uh, things look pretty great. Um, I ended up playing queen to h4 check, and then here my opponent, he unfortunately self-destructed. He ended up playing king to d1, and then knight f2 is a simple royal fork, and that's game. Um, the only move, again, okay, so king f1 isn't much better. <laughs> uh, so the only move to stay in the game would be knight to g3. Which, uh, it blocks the check. What happens next? Um, there's two moves in this position that I was uh, looking at. I wasn't sure which one I was going to do. And then when he blundered, I guess we'll never know. The two possibilities are either knight c5 or knight f6. Um... We have to do something with the knight, because the knight right now, the knight is hanging, right? I don't want to just take. He'll take back with the queen, and then I, I've lost a, a really good piece um, for one of his inactive pieces. Knight c5 is the move that I was looking at the most. It looks certainly thematic, as it's attacking the queen, but the computer doesn't like it very much. After something like queen e2, you can imagine, you know, g5, take, take. Why well, could even castle here? And the computer actually says that white is now marginally better. Uh, this pawn is actually attacked twice, and if we ever push it forward, then white simply has a beautiful square. The g-file is open. Um, white can actually get to the g-file first. He can move his king over. He can bring the rooks over. And black has no attack. It's simply a piece for a couple of pawns. And this is a really good piece right now. And so um, this is one of the uh, this is something I always have to be care careful about is when you're doing these sacrifices uh, pieces for pawns you're getting this dynamic compensation and again if we were to back up let's see can I back up this is that hard you know in this position you know with the queen moves uh, black does have dynamic compensation the computer says black is winning uh, interesting actually queen h4 isn't the most accurate move it's uh, apparently uh, queen to a5 is I saw I um calculated this I couldn't um, I ended up going with Queen h4 just because it seemed you know that's really thematic using this diagonal um, the idea would be again you can't do here because again that's the exact same fork as the game if you were to go here we have this interesting check check uh, or just a uh, capture and then after rook c8, uh, developing a piece with tempo ready to come in fold with f5 um, if the queen moves off this diagonal 
then this pawn falls with check. And again, that's three pawns for the piece. Uh, black is doing fantastic. And so in this variation, black gets all the activity. He either wins this pawn or white's queen is stuck basically on this square, always protecting that pawn. And again, uh, these pawns are able to march. Um, f file is going to open up and uh, black's crushing. Black is still doing very well in the queen h4 variation, especially after knight f6. Because again, you're, we're definitely going to win this pawn. White is able to at least castle into sort of safety. But again, as we know, the queen side isn't very uh, isn't very good. So that's the game. So uh, again, it was it would have been nice to have played out this uh, position if he would have played with knight g3. I think this would have made a very interesting game. Um, alas, we can only speculate. And now I I talked about the psychology of this. Down uh, I'm gonna paste in here the move times that you're gonna see here, and what you'll notice is that for white, the first part of the game, he never thought basically more than 30 seconds. He moved extremely quickly. And then what happened is when we got here, um, I took, when he recaptured, then in one second, I played this super fast. You can just imagine the psychological shock of that, where all of a sudden, whoa, where'd that come from? He then thought for a very long time, uh, relatively, before taking. He then thought for an even longer time, the second longest time before he moved queen to d3. Right, his queen's attacked, where's it gonna go? Uh, d3 is really the most obvious square, because again, he wants to be able to slide over after an eventual check. And then after the queen to um, h4 um, check here, he thought for over two minutes before playing king to d1, which is an elementary one move uh, fork, right? Why did this happen, right? How is an opponent who's moving very quickly for the first 15 moves in a long play game, and then all of a sudden he slows down, and as he slows down, he's making worse moves, or he's playing obvious moves very slowly, walking into a fork, right? It's because of that, I believe, it's because of that psychological shock, right? If he was expecting to attack, all of a sudden he's not attacking, and uh, quite literally, maybe you've um, experienced this in other contexts as well. It's like it, it's hard to shift your um, your head into gear to switch focus into something different to the point where you miss elementary um, items like this. I find the psychology aspect of chess so fascinating. I'm really in tune into that to the point where sometimes I don't even think about the chess tactics as they are. But that's really what I got out of this game is early on, I thought if I could attack him first, he would then play quite poorly. He would fall apart. And that's exactly what happened. I was able to look at the psychology. I think that's fantastic. I love it, um, especially when it works. And I would wager, I'm not perfect at it, but more often than not, when I get that sense of an opponent, often um, someone is, really likes attacking. That's very, very common. Someone is uncomfortable in the end game. Very common. Someone doesn't understand positional play. Um, they just start making random moves, or they start taking a really long time. So this tells me, okay, I should take it into the endgame, or I should not let them attack me, or I should make it as positional and complex as possible that way, and then they essentially beat themselves. This probably doesn't work, you know, on you know Magnus Carlsen or Aronian or those guys, because they're really good at everything, and they don't have um, the weaknesses that we amateurs do. But among amateur players, among imperfect chess players, non-masters, um, being acutely aware of this potential psychology uh, might be an interesting idea. And so uh, that was my main takeaway. Again, if there was no psychology in this game, then this would be a five-minute video. Hey, don't, don't lose your queen, right? But it's the steps that preceded the blunder. It's creating this position. It's getting that noticing that my opponent may um, be an attacker only and not have anything else that he really understands. Or um, he's rated 1,900. He's perhaps a 1,900 rated attacker. Maybe he's a 2,000 rated attacker. But at other aspects of chess, he's not as good. And that keeps his rating down. Same with me, right? Same with all of us, right? There's something that keeps our rating down. And I, I think I found that in this game. Um, at the very least, it's something to consider.
uh, something I like to consider. Well, that's that. That actually went on a little bit longer than I thought, but hey, I guess that makes it a Smithy Q video, right? Uh, like, comment, subscribe. This is my last video for a little bit. I think I lied. I said I'd have some more videos coming up. Whoops. <laughs> Life suddenly came up, but I made sure I got this one out of there. Again, every week I will try and have a long play game, and depending on uh, what happens in that game, they'll say what I talk about, and maybe there'll be some other stuff as well. It's hard, though, um, during the school season, so... Uh, let's see what happens after April at least. Anyway, that's that. Comment, subscribe, questions, comments, that's great. I'll put a link to the actual game if you want to actually look at the, uh, the analysis. But that's that. So again, it's SmithyQ, smithyq.com. Thanks for watching, everyone. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.